Hi, this is Jose Luis here and welcome to another video on this series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling. In this video, I would like to talk about two topics. I would like to present color and discuss how color is represented in computers and how it's manipulated when we do computational design. And then as an extension, I would also like to talk about images because at the, at the end of the day, images are just grids of pixels, two-dimensional grids of pixels each one of those pixels containing the value of a particular color. So if you think about it, in a way, images are just extensions of color, uh, are like arrays or lists or data trees or however you want to think of them uh, as colors. Now, here in Grasshopper, I am going to drop a component called the color picker. And when you drop it, maybe it looks something like this, hue saturation value but I would like you to click on the left box, the one that says RGB space. Because what I would like to introduce is the notion that just like any other thing, when we do computation, like for example, geometry, points, vectors, planes, nerves, geometry, everything, at the end of the day, it has to be able to have a numerical representation because computers, the only thing that they can do is pretty much manipulate numbers and store numbers. So color is no difference. And it turns out that during the history of computation, we have come up with many different ways of representing color numerically. And those ways are typically referred to as color spaces. What does that mean? Well, a color space is a convention to how to use numbers to represent color. And one of the most popular, the most widespread color spaces when working with color in computer graphics, in screens, in things that have uh, tiny lights that turn on and off, is the RGB color space. And if you are, for example, an image editing user, if you've done Photoshop, Illustrator, whatever, you might actually be very used to working with colors in RGB. Working with colors in RGB means that every color is represented by three numbers, and each number represents the amount of R for red, the amount of G for green, and the amount of blue for blue, for the amount of, for B <laughs> that, that, color, that that color contains. And that is because when it comes to screens, red, green, and blue are the three primary colors, and every other color in the visual spectrum can be represented by some blend of these three numbers. This is only for light. This is only for visual for screens. When it comes to print and paper and ink, it's three other different colors, okay? It's three other different primary colors. So it turns out that with three sliders, for example, we can represent any color, any combination of red, green, and blue, and therefore, obtain every color that lives in the visual spectrum, all right? So you can see how wide the color picker here is giving me three sliders for the red, green, and blue. And if I drop a panel, I can see that what is coming out is just basically three numbers. It's these three numbers RGB. So in a way, a, a color is a vector of numbers representing the red, green, and blue colors. And the components are RGB, okay? Now, why, does, why are these sliders in particular bound to this really strange domain from zero to 255 in integers? Why can I not have decimal parts? Well, it's, um, it's a little complicated. It's actually not complicated to explain, but it's, it's a little long, but basically, uh, by doing numbers from 0 to 255, what we have is 256 possible values for each channel, which turns out to be a really convenient number because data in computers is stored typically in 8-bit modules. And 8 bits correspond to 8 combinations of zeros and 1s. And it turns out that 8 permutations of two possible states equals 2 to the power of 8, which, if you crunch the numbers, is 256. That's it. It's a very simple rule, okay? Now, there is this additional third component, which is called A, which is typically referred to 
as alpha for transparency. Some color spaces also allow you to add a fourth number, which would be taken wherever it can accept transparency. It will be taken as the level of opacity of a particular value. Typically 255 is absolutely opaque and then zero is absolutely transparent. And anything in between is, you know, transparent colors. This color space RGB is by far the most popular one and the most common one when it comes to computer graphics and screens and uh, iPads and anything that has tiny, tiny lights shining. It's all about light, all right? However, arguably, it is not very intuitive for humans because if I say, I want some kind of um, dark orange, it's kind of difficult for me to figure out which number is that unless I have some kind of interface that lets me oh there's brown here and now I can see some orange here but if I move this a little bit now I think I'm some kind of like dark orange sort of space but out of my head I would be impossible for me to say that this has a orange that that the strong orange is a color that has a lot of red with a little bit of blue of green and a little bit less than blue but still some you know i as a human it's very difficult for me to understand that's why rgb color space is not the only one and there are other color spaces perhaps one of the most popular ones when it comes to um, intuitiveness is hsv hsv stands for hue saturation and value and i can switch i can toggle this color picker to hsv here and you can see that what this does is that it gives me three different sliders one of them controls the saturation so how much color or how light the color is the other no sorry so how much color there is in it or how black and white that color is the other one value represents how bright the color is or how dark the color is and the third one, hue, basically represents where I am in the color spectrum. So if you think of a rainbow, where I would position myself in that kind of rainbow. And the values for this one typically go from three, from zero to, from zero to 360, and then saturation and value go from zero to 100. So this, for humans, is a much more intuitive interface for colors because I can choose a color, so I know I want orange, so I'm going to go to orange, right? And then I know that I want a darker or a clearer orange, so I can move saturations and value and find where I want to be. And the combinations give me the exact same amount of numbers than in the other spaces. However, this is just basically a translation that makes it easier for humans. However, computers, at the end of the day, they do still need the RGB colors because it turns out that your screen, your monitor, your screen has like three tiny LEDs, a red, a green and a blue one for each pixel on your screen. And by turning them on and off with different intensities, that how, that's how you get color on a computer screen. So at the end of the day, no matter which color space you're using, you, the computer internally ends up needing RGB colors. And that's why, for example, this color picker, which is in HSV mode right now, is still giving me colors that look like RGB. You can see I am in full red right now, so I am at 255.00. Okay? So in Grasshopper, we can work with color by generating it this way, or we have a lot of options to generate colors on different color spaces. So for example, HSV, HSL, CMYK, which is specifically good for printing, or for example, XYZ, which is um, a fairly obscure, uh, it's, it's, for, it's, for, it's for screens for cinematographic applications. So now, and the other ones, I honestly have never heard of them, actually. <laughs> so, um, this is how we represent color and how we manipulate color. And we can, so a long story short, creating any color boils down to choosing which color space you want to be, typically RGB, but you could be something else, and setting up the three numbers for each one of the components of that color, the RGB channels 
or the other challenge and, and a translation. This is also super important because each one of these three numbers will be the ones that will define the color of every pixel when we talk about images. So speaking of images, of course, I'm going to show like a big ass image of myself. Look, look, wait, wait, it's like, it's like this. <laughs> but what's important to understand about images is that at the end of the day, they are basically a collection of pixels in two dimensions, with each one of them having a particular value for the color that they represent. So if I take this image and I start zooming in and in and in, you can see that I start getting to these really big pixels representing some color of my flesh in this case. And when I get closer to my mouth, things get um, a little darker, but each pixel basically is defining, is probably defined by three numbers called the RGB values, right? So if you think about it, images in a very abstract conceptual way, they are two dimensional arrays, two dimensional lists of points that contain three coordinates, R, G, B. And that's how they show up on your screen. And that's how they, we, and that's how they get stored inside of memory. Because that is the case, then working with them computationally is actually very simple because the only thing that we need to do is we need to be able to load them in memory. And then in memory, we will have some kind of data structure that will give us the RGB colors for each one of the pixels. How does that work in Grasshopper? In Grasshopper, if we go to input parameters and we go to input, you can see that uh, there are many different inputs that we haven't really seen, but there are different ways of bringing data in. But there's one that is super interesting, which is the image sampler. I'm going to drop this into my screen. And then you're going to see that it's basically this component that is empty by default. And if I right click or if I double click, you can see that I can set the file path for an image that I want to load into here. So for example, I'm going to load this image called heightfield.terrogen. Oh, actually, no, it's actually, so what I'm going to load is um, the image of myself that I just showed, Jose Luis, okay? So if I do this, you can see that what I get is this kind of menu that allows me to define a couple of things. First, it allows me to define which domain I want to set for my image. My image is square and I'm going to set that, for example, I want to set a domain from zero to one. What that means is that I can use this component to figure out the color values of any pixel on my image. But instead of working with pixels, what the image sampler does is it gives you a space with two coordinates, the X space and the Y space, coordinates going from zero to one, so that if I ask the image sampler for the color of that image at location 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, it will give me whatever pixel is closer to that location. If I tell it location 0 0.25 and 0 0.75, it will give me the color of this pixel here and so on and so on. And on top of that, I can also choose what do I want to know from the image. So for example, you can see that the default here is the RGBA color. So let's see how that works. So for example, I have my image here and I say, I'm going to create a point. I'm going to construct a point, correct. I'm going to construct a point that is going to go from zero to one and from zero to one and the X and Y, I don't care. And, but remember, this is going to generate an actual point on Rhino, but I don't care about that point because what I care is about generating something that has two coordinates that go from zero to one. And then when I plug this in here and I look at this, what I can see is that because I set 0.5 and 0.5 on an image that is being sampled from zero to one and zero to one, then it's going to give me the coordinate of the pixel in the middle of my chick. So the coordinate of this pixel, the color of this pixel is going to be whatever, this RGB. And you can see that if I now change, if I move all the way to the left, I am getting the coordinate of this, the color of this pixel. And if I go all the way to the top here, now it's giving me 
the color of this pixel. And if I see, and if I look closely, you can see that this is kind of gray. And you can see that these three values are roughly the same. They're very similar, which means that this is kind of working. And because the three values are high, this is a light gray. So let me see if I can find the color somewhere here. That's going to be X 0.25, for example, more or less like this, and Y is going to be almost zero. And you can see that I get a very dark color. So you can see that the three numbers are very low. And you can see that they're also very similar. So this means that it's, it's a blackish color. All right. Okay, great. So what that means is that, that with the image sampler, I can find the colors for any particular location on top of the image. In this case, again, the image sample doesn't really work with pixels. It works with this concept of the domain that I can set for an image from zero to one and from zero to one. But how is this useful? <laughs> how we can actually use any of this? Well, let me show you an example. Let's say that the image we said is, is let's imagine that the image actually measures from zero to one units in each direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in my Rhino and I'm going to create a grid of points. Where are my grid of points? Here. I'm going to create a grid of square points where the total size of the square is going to be one. So for example, I would like to have 10, I would like to have 10, um, 10, uh, I would like to have 10 cells on the grid and I would like each one of them to have a size of 0 0.1. Sorry, the size is, sorry, the size is this one and how many there are, it's the number 10. So I mistake, I mistook that. Okay. And then you can see that here, one of the outputs is the points on the points on that so you see that I have a grid of points from zero to one, from zero to one, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I sample the image in all of those points that are going from zero to one and zero to one in this direction, what I will get is a list of all the colors for that image on this, on for each one of these points. And if I want to, what I can do with that is, for example, I can place some geometry on top of this grid that I can color with the color of the image. So for example, let me say that I'm going to create a bunch of spheres here. I'm going to place the spheres on top of the, um, on top of the grid and the radius would have to be half the size of the cell. So for that, I'm going to, um, I'm going to set this to 0 0.05 or I would do it parametrically, but you know, all right. So, these are now all these cells. And then you can see that here under preview, under display, there's actually a category called preview that allows me to, instead of using the typical red and green preview of Grasshopper, it allows me to customize that with a custom preview. So I'm going to use custom preview to here in here, change, for example, to this default material, which is a kind of pink that I don't really like. But if I use instead for this, I use all the colors for those points, you can see that now, very interestingly, I have this kind of uh, ball representation of my face of some kind. You see how each one of the pixels kind of has this... Um, kind of has this, uh, this face on it, <laughs> you know? So I'm using the colors to color, to, um, to preview each one, of these, each one of these spheres, okay? So that's one thing I could do. Another thing that I could do is, for example, I could just put an image sampler, and then I'm going to load this image sampler with a file that is a kind of height terrain. So it's a black and gray, it's a black and white image. It's a grayscale image that is kind of representing a topographic field. So something, and if I think of this grayscale going from zero being black as the lower parts of the topography, 
and the values of white being the height ones, being the higher parts of the topography, then something that I can do is I can use that, for example, to, I can, I can parse all the images, I can parse the images and you can see how this image is actually perfect grayscale because every single pixel has the same values for each one of the channels. So that's how you know that an image is actually perfectly black and white. And what I could use this is, for example, to display now to create a bunch of, I'm going to hide these things here. I could use this to generate, for example, a collection of cylinders that are centered on these points and that have the tiny radii that I have. But each one of the heights of these cylinders could correspond to the height of each one of these points here. So black for very low and white for very high. The problem is I cannot really plug this in here. Oh, I can actually, uh, <laughs> because it's three numbers. So what I wanted to say is that a different thing that we can do with the image sampler is instead of choosing to get all the RGBA colors, I can choose to just take the red channel instead or only the green channel or only the blue channel. And you can see how now this becomes a number. Or I can choose, for example, to take the brightness. If this was a colored image, the brightness is the average of the three RGB colors. So I can use that as well. And this will give me something from zero to one. I can plug that in here. And now you can see that I have a this kind of family of cylinders of sorts that I'm going to move here and that I'm going to shape and which are going to be are going to be higher in the areas where I have more white you can see here are going to be lower in the areas where I have more black so that's going to be here and here and somewhere in the middle okay so again because images and colors at the end of the day they're just numbers or arrays of numbers then what do I use those numbers for? It's absolutely up to you. You are the one who can interpret those numbers for the generation of geometry, for creating paths, for I don't know, whatever that is. And actually, in the exercises, in the practice exercises that are going to come after this video, we're going to actually try to take this image and turn it into a real topography, a surface that has that shape. And on top of that, we're also going to take try to get a little more creative with my face <laughs> and create a pattern of circles that are larger or bigger depending on my face and that we could use for 3D printing, no, more like for laser cutting perhaps. So I think that's where I wanted to take this talk to. That's what, it, that's what we're going to do. This is going to be the video and then I think I'm just going to move on to the hands-on exercises. Thank you very much. And if you think you learned anything with this video, then maybe consider liking it or even subscribing to the channel. Okay. Thank you very much. See you on the next video. Bye.